everybody. Welcome back to another Tuesday's Tech Talk. This week we're kind of picking up where we left off last week when we started a discussion about crossover design. Laid a little bit of a foundation as far as what we look at, what we consider before we re really get into doing crossover design work. And uh, this week we took one of the speakers that we've had in line here for an upgrade and we're going to use it as an example. This is it right behind me here. It's a KEF 102 model. And it was a speaker that was, um, it had some good qualities about it, but it was also um, somewhat lifeless, um, lacking resolution, lacking detail. Uh, there were a lot of things about it that could be improved. This lovely piece of work here is the crossover that came out of it. This crossover uses all of the cheapest budget level parts. Um, there are about uh, nine inductors on this board. All small gauge, all iron core inductors, all the capacitors are all electrolytic capacitors. All of the resistors are the cheap sand cast resistors. So, great candidate for upgrade. Um, we just need the speaker here so we can take measurements and testing. And like I said last week, we don't go into crossover design with an idea in our head that, oh, I'm going to design a fourth order Linkwitz Riley filter for this. And you don't, you don't go in and design it based on electrical parameters. Uh, if you do, you're not even going to be in the ballpark on a lot of this stuff. Uh, and this one is a perfect example of a speaker where you really need to look at the acoustic output of the drivers and look at what it's asking for and what it's giving you. Um, as an example, this week I, I measured just the tweeter and I'll have Ron throw up the measurement of the tweeter. You can see it here in red. Uh, the tweeter's response is a rising response. You'll see it go up and it reaches a peak at about 2K Hertz. And the reason that it has that peak is because the tweeter's loaded into the center of the woofer. So it's using the woofer like a waveguide or as um, kind of like a horn in a way. It's got this effect of, you know, acting as if it's a horn. What happens is the lower wavelengths spread out and into that cone and cause some compression. It increases that output. So you get this response that starts at one end and starts ramping up in the lower frequency range until it hits a peak and then it just drops off rather abruptly. So what do you do on something like that? I mean you have to again you have to look at what it's asking for and there's guys out there who'll say well the best for crossover is no crossover or the best crossover is a first order crossover or some theory that they've seen on the internet that makes them feel like a certain typology is going to be better than some other typology but in the end you got to look at what it's asking for. So I put a first order filter uh, on the tweeter um, and I measured it and saved it in purple. You can see it on the screen here in this other measurement. Um, and you can see it dropped the sensitivity. Uh, it flattened out the response pretty nicely, but you'll see that as it approaches that lower frequency range, there's still a knee. There's still a peak there. Um, it's not a smooth response. And then you'll notice the drop-off at the end of it. The drop-off is like 48 dB per octave or something. It just drops like a rock. And then I put a second-order filter on it. Uh, you'll see it in light blue. Uh, notice it knocked the knee out of it. And so that actually created a response that you can work with and start to blend the other driver. Now notice again we're talking about a, uh, a frequency response where you've got 48 dB per octave or greater fall with just a second order, even third order filter. You're, even when I added the third order filter to it, you're not really changing the roll off at the bottom. You're just, you're just addressing the frequency range within the band it's playing. You're lifting it up or down within those ranges by the manipulation of those parts a little bit. And a first order filter, we talked about 
that's as if we added a single capacitor in line with it. A capacitor is a device that is going to allow high frequency to pass. It's going to keep low frequency from passing. And if you just have one part in it, that's what's called an electrical first order filter, which is not to be confused with an acoustical first order filter or an acoustic first order slope, I should say. Those are very independent of each other. Um, it can be a first order filter and it can have a resistor in front of it. It could ha have a, uh, an inductor, a capacitor, and a resistor after that as a notch filter. It could have two notch filters and a capacitor and a resistor. It could have 12 parts lined up in all in a line there and still just be a first order filter. So don't think of it as a first order filter of just being a single part. It could be a lot of parts still creating just a first order filter. Now, when does it become a second order filter? Well, second order filter is when it's got a, then a leg going to ground. You have a capacitor and an inductor going to ground. That's creating 12 dB per octave roll off. That, that's why they call that a second order. It could uh, be an inductor and a capacitor in shunt uh, to ground. That would be a typology you'd see if you're trying to block the high frequency. So if you're putting it on a, on a woofer, you might see an inductor and a capacitor making that second order. And again, a single part could create a first order. But again, don't confuse the electrical filters with acoustic roll-offs. Notice again the tweeter that we just measured. I put a first order filter on it, but notice at the end you still had 48 dB per octave roll-off or greater. So on the woofer, in order to match it, I had to use what's called an elliptical filter, which allows that woofer to play out there to it, and then it forces the woofer to drop rather steeply so that they blend at the same roll off and make a smooth response. And, and then this model has a internal woofer that has an additional filter that is just playing through the port. So what I wound up with this was creating a nice smooth plus or minus a dB and a half frequency response from end to end, much smoother than what this created. It wound up being only 12 parts and in this case it's going to be 12 high quality parts instead of 26 junk parts. <laughs> so there's a little snippet, a little look into crossover design. Again, to design a crossover for you, we need the speaker here. We need it in the cabinet that it's going to go in. We want to measure those drivers in the cabinet that they're going to be in so we can look at the actual acoustic response and design it based on the acoustic output of the drivers. Just like this one here, it had a response where the filter had to adjust it within its passband. It had to adjust what's going on within the range that it's playing, not just rolling off the end. That's what we have to do when we design a passive filter. That's why a lot of electronic filters and things like that, they're textbook slopes, so that they're not going to work properly. Next week we'll dive into this a little deeper and look at a little more complex filter design and look at maybe a whole speaker. Uh, I've got a whole line of them here uh, of upgrades to do. Maybe I'll pick another one and we'll look at something else. Thanks for tuning in. I hope this was helpful. If you have questions about crossover design, drop them in the comments section and I'll see if I can address it. Thanks again for coming.